Shalom and welcome to yet another episode of TV7 Editor's Note. I'm Jonathan Hassan, the Editor-in-Chief of TV7 Israel. And joining me all the way from Madrid, Spain, is my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Rafael Barraji, uh, who, among others, you all at home recognize him, of course, from our monthly Europa Stance Productions, but uh, formerly, of course, the National Security Advisor of Spain, uh, the Coordinator of uh, Intelligence of uh, the Kingdom of Spain as well, as I won't go through your entire curriculum vitae, since it's very impressive, uh, but uh, uh, very long indeed, and uh, currently the CEO of Worldwide Strategy, which you founded uh, and is doing a great job globally, uh, but also you founded the Friends of Israel initiative, uh, something that, of course, we are very keen on, on seeing more. The high military group is expected to be joined uh, by you uh, here in Israel this coming week. Uh, but uh, before we dive into all of that, Rafael, uh, if I may open with prayer, and then uh, we will communicate further. Thank you, Lord, for today, Father. Thank you for the blessing and privilege of being able to... Uh, really be here and, and serve you in this capacity, Father Lord. I pray that today's uh, program will be an interesting production, that uh, all who watch us all over the world will truly be encouraged by what they hear and really informed by the challenges that we face. Pray to uh, uh, those uh, issues and also act in order to make a difference uh, for your namesake, Lord, and for the peace of Jerusalem, as uh, we're called to do. Father, we pray for uh, guidance and leading in all that we do and uh, to truly impact the nations for your namesake. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Rafael, uh, if I may, uh, I already noted the high military group is supposed to come here. It's a group. Uh, I won't go into it. How about you take the reins here? Uh, thank you, Jonathan, and thank you for having me once again. Yes, uh, as you mentioned, we created uh, French Official Initiative 13 years ago at a time when the delegitimation campaign against the system of Israel was at its high in Europe and in other parts of the world, including Latin America, American University, well, you know, you name it. Uh, and uh, after the 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 first uh, I mean the first one of the, the major operation in Gaza uh, we created the higher level military group formed by twelve former defense chief of staff or chief of operation from different countries from Australia to Colombia including America and several European countries and we had been visiting in field trips to Israel several times uh, according to the security circumstances. Now there's a new government in place, but also, uh, above all, I think there are new realities that are going to affect the strategic environment of Israel, no? starting from the relation with Russia and Iran uh, over Syria, the relation of Israel uh, to Europe and America uh, with the background of the Ukraine invasion and war. So um, there is the changing phase of warfare. We were focused in the past on the missiles uh, capabilities of uh, Israel's enemies. Now, perhaps, we also have to take into consideration uh, the drone uh, war, uh, like the Star Wars, you know, the clone with the drone wars, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, so I think it's, it's the, the, the strategic environment is changing from the traditional perspective we have to something new. We don't know yet exactly what it's going to be. And that's why our interest as a high-level military group to engage with peers in the IDF and in the, gov in the new government and also in the opposition uh, forces to understand better the perception of Israel and also to discuss what our views are also uh, regarding the, the security envelope of the country. Indeed. You, of course, uh, have been here repeatedly uh, with uh, multiple of those groups, uh, met with the uh, chiefs of uh, defense uh, and uh, the IDF, of course, uh, chiefs of general staff, uh, previously uh, Lieutenant General Aviv Kochavi, but now there is a new general in office. Uh, uh, he was the deputy of Aviv, uh, but at the same time, he is uh, still uh, uh, new in command, if uh, I may added that. Uh, what is your recognition of uh, the, the fact that 
he, he is less experienced when it comes to leading, you know, the, the major organization. Well, I think everyone, when uh, they reach a certain level, are new completely in the new post and responsibilities. No? The, good, the good thing is the experience they have accumulated over time. No? And in that case, I don't have any, the, the minimum doubt, I mean, the, I don't have any doubt whatsoever that the team leading the IDF and the Ministry of Defense today in Israel is well experienced, is well oriented, and they know how to deal with the, 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 the problems. And, Unfortunately, Absolutely. unfortunately, yeah. Unfortunately, indeed, we have many challenges up ahead. One of the key challenges, of course, the Islamic Republic of Iran. Just last week, the International yeah. Atomic Energy Agency, which monitors Iran uh, and inspects Iran, not only under the JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, which, of course, uh, many know as uh, the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, it does not exist anymore, technically speaking, but... Iran is still a signatory to the Non-Proliferation Treaty under which it must declare any changes within its nuclear activities. Now, the IAEA circulated a report amongst the Board of Governors or member states of its Board of Governors in which uh, it highlighted that in a uh, surprise inspection in Fordo, the nuclear installation, they found that Iran decided uh, without informing anyone to increase uh, or to change cascades in order to increase once again to 60% enriched uranium, very close to 90%. Uh, nobody really knows the degree of accumulated yeah. materials at this stage. What is being done and what can be done? Well, first of all, we have to remember that Iran has never been transparent. On the contrary, it has been lying and deceptive uh, on the intent, ambitions, and scope of the nuclear program and it still is lying to all international institutions and organizations. Second, uh, we have to be conscious that Iran has been developing faster and faster uh, the enriching, enriching capabilities. And in the last uh, year and a half under the Biden administration, the path has also rocketed up in, in the sense that they have been accumulating more than is allowed to them by the old DCPOA and they have moved from the 20% enriched uranium to 60% and pro possibly a little bit beyond that uh, with a clear military purpose. Uh, we can debate whether they have enough material, fissile material for a bomb, two bombs, three bombs, six bombs, whatever. That's not the problem. The problem is that they are capable of having the, the, the only thing that they didn't have, which is the fissile material. It will take time, but uh, this time it has been shortening and shortening every day. Uh, and uh, on the contrary, uh, despite all evidence, the international community is still stuck in the traditional position. Sanctions will work, and what we are trying to achieve is to delay the development of the program. And uh, I'm afraid I think we are reaching a point where a major decision will, like to ha will have to be taken because we are reaching that non-return point for the Iranian nuclear program to become military and, uh, and, 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 and weaponized. So. I think for Israel it's a new situation, and uh, and they have to to take into consideration not only the developments of the Iranians, the defensive capabilities, and the international um, sleeping uh, and appeasing uh, attitude no, that we have. Indeed. Well, uh, you know, initially speaking, when the Biden administration took over from the Trump administration, which obviously uh, engaged in a, a maximum pressure campaign with. Plans B, C, D, and, and these weren't unveiled at the time. Uh, but uh, ultimately, when we're looking at the picture, the Biden administration, as you noted, initially decided to engage in diplomacy, saying that diplomacy first. And then uh, despite being quite clear to everyone, including yourself and myself, that this policy is now failing time and again because, as you mentioned, that Iran is not transparent about its actions, is not a partner in good faith, uh, so to speak. Uh, we, we have come to a reality in which we can basically recognize that the Biden administration has failed, its European partners have failed. For that matter, uh, their engagement with China and Russia and this uh, uh, P5 plus one, or the five permanent members of the Security Council and, and Germany, uh, was not a viable 
composition at the get-go because the strategic interests weren't aligned from the foundation of those talks. So at what point will those international leaders come out and announce that they practically failed? Well, I think nobody wants to declare themselves that they have been sustaining a failing policy, you know, a total catastrophe. Secondly, I think the Europeans and the Americans are uh, in a risk avoidance uh, attitude. So they, if they can buy some time not to confront anyone, particularly Iran, uh, they will do so. You know? uh, and thirdly, uh, as uh, some people may, may think, well, essentially, this is an Israeli problem, first and foremost, no? uh, or a regional problem. So I think uh, for the Europeans, which we are now taking completely by the economic crisis, the energy crisis, and the, the, the war in, in, in Ukraine, Iran is a far away problem, I'm afraid, not to, to put energy and political capital. No? And in Washington, uh, unless we had the Ukrainian uh, Iranian intervention, I think they will be rushing today to to reach a second uh, comprehensive agreement, you know, allowing Iran to develop even more and uh, furthermore uh, the nuclear program. Also, we have to remember that there are still riots and demonstrators in the street every day after six months of repression. And that's also a complication for the Iranian regime to get what the demands they ask the, the Americans. You no, know? thanks God. No? I think that those two obstacles has prevented the United States administration to reach a, 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 a terrible a second agreement with Iran. Indeed. Uh, at the same time, when we look at what they used to say, pledging time and again that Iran will never pass the nuclear threshold of becoming a nuclear threshold state. Later, when uh, uh, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States military, General uh, uh, Milley, uh, yeah. came to Israel, uh, we had our editor at large, Amir Oren, ask him during one of uh, the meetings uh, of, you know, is this pledge viable? So he changed the terminology and said that the United States remains committed not to allow Iran to field a nuclear weapon. Now they also have managed to uh, deploy the Shahid-3, which is capable yeah. of ne carrying nuclear payloads in breach of Article 3 uh, or Annex B of uh, Article 3 in the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action and UN Security Council uh, Resolution 2231. Uh, it, it seems like every time the Biden administration under, uh, or the United States under the current administration is changing the terms to basically provide itself that political leeway in order to say, no, we haven't failed, diplomacy is still first, but uh, we're now also considering alternative options. To yeah, what correct. end? Well, I think uh, everything is based upon the belief in the American administration that the problem is the nuclear bomb, the physical arsenal or nuclear arsenal in the hands of the Ayatollahs. The nuclear capable Iran is something else, no? and they have are not been able to see the risk and the, 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 the fine line that make it the, the distance between a nuclear capable Iran and a nuclear armed Iran. No? That's the problem. Uh, for Israel, two weeks time is nothing. And uh, two nuclear bombs in the hands of Iran is everything. So um, the perspective is totally different. And I don't think the Americans are, are open enough to understand that for the Israelis and for many pe people in the world, a nuclear capable Iran is as bad as a nuclear armed Iran. No? Indeed. Well, I'd like to ask particularly also about Europe in this case, since uh, the E3, Germany, mm -hmm. Britain and, uh, of course, France are also active partners within uh, the so-called P5 plus one in trying to find a solution to uh, Iran's nuclear ambitions. And everybody is not, uh, let me use my words carefully, everybody is aware of Iran's ambitions, everybody is aware of its activities behind the scenes, and they're aware to a certain degree even more than Iran is aware about itself. Um, to what degree does that disconnect between leadership and the intelligence community, between the, the woke idealisms that are being constantly driven forward at the expense of reality, um, 
come at the detriment of the people of Europe? I think if you get a report from any intelligence service in Europe uh, regarding the nuclear ambitions of Iran, you cannot make any distinction from what the Israeli intelligence service may tell the prime minister in Jerusalem. I think on the on the on the picture side, we all agree on what where we are and what the Iranians want to achieve. No, the issue is whether you believe the Iranians may react to incentives and also react to uh, sticks, no, and uh, and uh, and uh, like sanctions. And I think the European political uh, elite is convinced that uh, playing with carrots and sticks, we can convince the Iranians to behave in a more normalized uh, uh, manner, uh, which for me is, is naive or stupid, or both at the same time, no? and, and uh, I'm, in, in any case, quite risky if we are wrong. No? So that's why I think uh, Israel cannot accept this attitude, because uh, it, there is no margin of safety. Uh, in this policy for Israel whatsoever. Israel has been under a lot of uh, um, stress or criticism uh, from uh, particularly the United States, but also other countries, over its refusal to send uh, uh, various technologies to Ukraine, uh, which ultimately, when, uh, as you know uh, very well, if you send certain technologies to uh, warring countries and the other sides uh, manages to take those weapons and uh, ultimately um, reverse engineer those, it's able to basically render it incapable of doing anything at some point. So uh, why is the Western community led by the United States so adamant on the, uh, the state of Israel sending the Iron Dome, David Sling, even to a certain degree, uh, they already asked in Kiev for the pay, uh, yeah. for the arrow, of course, which Israel would never do. Um, but that, thankfully, the United States has already said that uh, that is off the table, uh, to say the least. Yeah, to start with, I think there is a, a false distinction between European and American elites nowadays between defensive system and offensive weapons. Uh, that's why we are so reluctant to send. Uh, jets uh, uh, to to Ukraine, or why we had been so slow in debating whether to send tanks or not. No? Uh, but you know, defensive system is good. Offensive system, well, debatable. And and since Israel is the leader in the world of anti ballistic missile defenses, well, people thought that because of the links to Ukraine and uh, because Zelensky is Jewish, there may be some more help. No? Also because NATO. Uh, is running out of uh, ammunition to to send to Ukraine. I'm afraid, no. And in the coming months, uh, we will see that. Uh, but I think it's a misplaced criticism. Uh, first of all, we have all to understand that Israel is sitting to a great power in Syria, which is Russia, uh, and mm -hmm. uh, with an emerging part, regional power, which is Iran, also in Syria, and uh, and uh, and they have to deal with that, no. And uh, in order to prevent the Iranians to be rooted in Syria, they have to reach an agreement to some extent informal uh, as to the ability to operate in Syria against Iran despite the Russian presence. So that's something which is difficult to understand or to see or to perceive uh, in Europe. And that's why the criticism of not doing enough, uh, enough from the Israeli side, despite the fact that all humanitarian aid that Israel has been provided from the very beginning to the refugees getting out uh, of the hospitals and deployed in Ukraine. Indeed. Well, uh, I must say, when I had a conversation with one of the sinks or one of the top American generals on this topic, uh, and he voiced his disappointment on the matter, uh, I, I mentioned, you know, the, the fact of the matter is there are roughly 460,000 rockets currently in Syria and Lebanon combined directed yeah. at Israel. Israel does not have enough Iron Dome aerial defense yeah. systems to protect yeah. itself from all those different missiles at this stage. So, uh, you know, to demand uh, Israel to send it at a uh, uh, time when it would be at a, its own detriment is not only irresponsible, but also quite shameable, in, in my opinion. Um, but let's move to the theater that you just spoke of. 
Syria, we have Russia, we have Iran, quite active in those areas. Those two countries are operating closer and closer. Uh, we see also uh, that Russian connection now uh, with Turkey increasing. Uh, is, is there something going on that we should be concerned about? Of course, uh, we should always be wary, but to what degree should we be concerned? Well, I think in the last year we had an understanding that uh, Russia will not oppose pushing out of Syria uh, the Iranian presence. Uh, with the new links uh, forged through Ukraine, uh, well, that may may change in the in the in the in the Putin's uh, mind or in the Kremlin's plans. No, that, that's something that uh, the intelligence in Israel should be aware aware of and uh, uh, carefully focusing whether they may have the same freedom of action in the future that they they, they that the IDF enjoy today. You know, uh, it's a good it's an open question. We don't know. Oh, I mean, at least I don't know how how to answer that. But I, it is something of concern, definitely. Indeed. Uh, another question that uh, came to mind, and uh, I, I'm very keen on hearing your uh, position on this. I haven't asked this behind the scenes yet, so uh, <laughs> this is a point that uh, um, I found quite precarious. Uh, just several weeks after the European Union, um, of course, went. Uh, or faced quite the corruption scandal with Qatar basically bribing, uh, I don't know how many, but more than dozens of uh, politicians, uh, parliamentarians, lawmakers, the vice president of the European Union's uh, institution, no less. Um, and we still have a lot of Islamist um, parties within Europe, including, for instance, Denk in the Netherlands and other places that are being um, accused of connection to the EKP party in Turkey, and of course, which is funded also by Qatar, which is ironic. Suddenly, the deal that was signed at the brokerage of the United States, of course, Amos Hochstein led that, between Israel and Lebanon vis-a-vis -vis the, the maritime border, yeah. okay. now that same gas fields are not going to be French-Italian, they're going to be French-Qatari. How mm -hmm. did Qatar enter into the mix, considering also within that calculus the fact that Lebanon is considered to be one of the most corrupt, if not the cor most corrupt, country in the Middle East and beyond? Yeah, uh, well, I don't know the specific of how they did it, uh, but you know, Qatar and uh, other Gulf countries, not only Qatar, has been in Europe increasingly uh, through financial systems and financial means. No? Uh, they have foundations, they have uh, uh, football teams, they have TV stations, they have newspapers, they have fashion uh, brands. So the penetration of the, what it, it was called in the past, the petrodollars, I mean the dollars in the Qatari hands, are, are, are preposterous, no? uh, um, and that's why they they just bribe with uh, total impunity uh, European parliamentarians just to clean up the, the the narrative about the Qatar and the and the World Cup. No? Uh, but it's not only Qatar; Morocco also bribed uh, quite a substantial amount of uh, parliamentarians and probably. Uh, people in charge of the executive powers in the European Commission just to change policies. No? So I think it's something we need we need to take uh, carefully into consideration, dig a little bit more, and, and, and if possible, extract the, the conclusion and the action which are needed to clean up the house and, and, uh, and not be playing the same, uh, you know, the puppets of the foreign powers of the, of the Gulf. And regarding the Lebanon and the French company, I think, uh, well, the French and Lebanese has been always very close. And, uh, and the Qataris are very well present with, uh, the, within the financial system in France. So that's the, 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 probably the, 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 the highway to the, for them to be so powerful. Indeed, of course, uh, Paris uh, Saint-Germain and other uh, very big sporting groups uh, make it quite obvious how in the forefront they want to be. But we have roughly two and a half minutes, and I, I just want to mention very briefly the fact that uh, a senior intelligence official here in Israel, who is still active, so I won't name his name, but he, he told me, 
Could you have imagined in 20, uh, 2004, 2005, at the time, Qatar, next to Saudi Arabia, being put aside by the United States, now reversing the whole system yeah. in which the United States basically uh, created a persona non grata by, you know, Mohammed bin Salman, the, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, and shunning the entire GCC in which she has declared, you know, Qatar as a major non-NATO member uh, or ally of the United States under the Biden administration. Of course, this uh, raises a lot of questions about yeah. how the Muslim Brotherhood acts and works uh, behind the scenes. But um, one, two sentences, what should we focus on in the near future? In your opinion, what are you going to advise the Israeli officials that you're going to meet in uh, the next couple of days? Well, basically, I think we need to look at the mirror, discard all assumptions and be prepared to deal with new situations and new challenges. Uh, in, in, in new ways, no? from the technical military point of view to the strategic analysis. There are too many things which are unknown and new to us and we need to be prepared to deal with all of them at once in a, in a new fashion because the old ways are not producing the goods that we were expecting. Dr. Rafael Bardají, former National Security Advisor in Spain, CEO of Worldwide Strategy, and uh, co-founder and, and uh, head of the Friends of Israel Initiative. So uh, I deeply appreciate you. You know that. And I thank you so very much for taking out of your busy time to partake in today's Editor's Note. Thank you very much. Always my pleasure. Until thank next you. time, indeed. And I'd like also to thank all of our viewers at home. God bless you. Keep praying for the situation. Also hold uh, prayers for the high military group coming here to Israel to deliberate the the very unique situation currently which Israel finds itself in. But until next time, Shalom. I have set watchmen on your walls, O Jerusalem, said the prophet Isaiah long ago. In our time, these watchmen have been Israel's creative and dedicated military and security experts in and out of uniform who have joined us on TV7IsraelNews.com to share their stories and lessons. I am Amir Oren, the host of this special series. Please join us for this unique opportunity to get acquainted with the people who have been standing watch on Israel's walls.